I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. Today, my friend, therapist and facilitator Laura Parker interviews me, Dean Walker, on the evolution of the work of living resilience, the poetry of predicament, and deep adaptation. All right, welcome to yet another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast. I am really excited about today. This particular episode is uh, brought to you by the sheer generosity of a good buddy of mine, Laura Parker, whom I've uh, interviewed on this podcast before about her uh, remarkable series of interviews on loneliness. And uh, we just happened to meet up and, and there was a great sinking of an, and uh, alignment with our different uh, areas of focus in our lives. We've stayed uh, fast friends since then. And uh, in a recent checking in, because we check in from time to time, what are you up to? How's it going? Laura was kind enough to ask, you know, does anybody ever interview you on your own podcast? Would you like to speak about what you're up to? And I thought, yeah, that's, that sounds great. There's a, a tremendous amount to share, a lot of new uh, developments in my work and this uh, livingresilience.net website and the coaching and the podcast, and there's a lot to share. So um, before I turn it over to Laura to become the uh, interviewer of this particular episode, I uh, just want to say that uh, our conversation, Laura's and mine, uh, our conversations as we catch up with one another from time to time have been extraordinarily valuable. And uh, I think you'll, you'll hear some overlaps with other people who have been interviewed here, like Clinton Callahan and Joe Brewer, and uh, perhaps some others will show up. I, I'm hoping that this will be as valuable for you, the viewer of this episode, as it is for us. Uh, you know, really, this is the beginning of a, a year of taking a stand for a, a whole new dimension of sobriety and uh, extraordinary level of conversation in both the podcast and also in all the other offerings that you'll hear us talk about. So um, this is really a kickoff of, of a very different, uh, new and hopefully far greater iteration of all this stuff, the podcast, the website, all that stuff. So Laura, thank you so much for uh, this offer and uh, take it away. <laughs> Okay. Well, Dean, I'm so happy to be here with you today. And yeah, the inspiration for what we're doing today came from my own desire to really hear about how you live with the knowledge that we both carry. Um, I see you as someone who's farther along on the path than I am. And I think that all of us need people who are farther along on whatever path we're on because uh, those people can show us the way and to some extent and maybe we don't have to reinvent the wheel quite so much if we have people like that who are in our lives so you have been facing this world situation this planetary predicament for a long time dean and I'm, you know, I think that I've been really grappling with it for less than a year, really, like really, really waking up to the severity of things. Up until that point, for the last 10 years, I've been more, um, you know, woke to some extent. But anyway, the last year has been quite pivotal for me. And where I am right now, 
this is my question for you. How do you live knowing what you know and how do you find joy? Because where I'm at, knowing what I know, I'm filled with hatred and disgust for, and contempt for humanity. And I'll tell you, it's not very comfortable to walk around feeling that come up. Everything I see, everywhere I go, I see um, the way that humanity is mucking with things and making things not work. Mm -hmm. And I can't not see that. And what I'm noticing is that it's killing my joy. And I don't want to close my eyes to what's going on, but I also don't want to be miserable. So I'm just curious if you have anything to share about how you live. How do you find joy? Yeah. Well, thank you. It's a wonderful question, and it really is a joy to be having this conversation in a public way with you. It's um, uh, tremendously valuable to be in this conversation. So what came up for me when you were asking that and, and laying out the question as it lives for you, I, I remember back to writing The Impossible Conversation a couple of years ago. And really, that's, that was the second half of the book. That was the entire answer that I was able to come up with. You know, the first half of the book was what's really going on. And that was not just abrupt climate change. That was any number of other desperately important measures of our impact on this planet. The kind of thing that would, could make a person justifiably rageful that you were just describing. I'm with you. Those are very real uh, feelings to, to be grappling with. And so, uh, and that's on the the collapse of human systems and it's also on the collapse of earth systems and both are equally impactful just depending on what a person's system registers with so i really hear your question and it's it's a very real question for me ongoingly as well mm. let me just qualify by saying uh, i'm i'm not doing this work uh, any portion of it, the website, the coaching, the learning series that we'll be talking about, all these pieces that, that uh, I've been creating, this is not meant at all to have me show up as someone with all the answers or some sort of guru or someone that uh, has their shit together in a magic way here. Um, I'm as, as deeply challenged as the next person in every dimension, the, everything you've just said and, and more. I go through my waves, I'm extraordinarily challenged at a level that I never dreamt that would occur in my lifetime or any of, any of our lifetimes. But I, what I do have is a, a long life history of my own deep, deep practices in a number of different dimensions from uh, shamanic and energetic studies for over decades to uh, transformational technology work with regard to uh, how to reclaim some of our long ago forfeited agency in life, the deeply disempowered state that most of us are in as we engage with the business as usual paradigm, it seems to demand of us that we set aside that agency, that we set aside our self-awareness, that we set aside right relationship with other human beings. We set aside our right relationship with earth. You know, and the, the jargon that I use in the book is that we disconnected from all the major sources of meaning in a human life. Mm -hmm. Kind of like at Disneyland, you have to be this tall to ride this ride. Well, you have to give up all of those primary connections to meaning in order to be functional and to be especially to be highly rewarded in the business as usual paradigm. And that's all we've known in our schooling, in our parenting. That's, that's the way it's done here. So I really hear your question. 
and yeah. I can grab so. I'm so sorry, I was just gonna say, we have to give it all up, and we also have to give up even the awareness that we're doing it, because I think if we were aware that we're doing it, there would be some mechanism that might help us to not do it, but we have, that's how we go to sleep, is yeah. turning off our awareness of what's really going on. Yeah. It, it's what allows us, you know, what I call that skill is override. And it's, it's the one skill that we collectively around the world, people who are involved with the business as usual paradigm, which is just about everybody, we learn how to override the core, authentic, deep signals from the life within us that would have us make other choices. So it, it allows us to create a culture in which a child like Greta Thunberg comes on the screen and is extraordinarily powerful, speaking truth that no adult on the planet is speaking, certainly at her scale. And we create a, a culture in which it's completely acceptable to have the kind of death threats and trolling that she's having to encounter and grapple with every day. And thank goodness she has quite a capacity and quite a sense of humor and she's able to deflect it pretty significantly. But the same thing is true with the uh, never again children that were the survivors of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting last year in Florida, you know, they've been threatened, as far as I know, on a daily basis, controlled on a daily basis. And this is the kind of environment that we've now normalized. Yeah. So there's no question how it's actually a, a sign of health, I think, that you've just asked what you've asked. Mm. And it's, it's really part of why I am doing this work, why I'm offering the tools that I've been able to gather. We're gonna talk about some of those tools that I've been able to either pull from my own experience and my own lineage and practices over a lifetime. And also I've been you know, uh, scanning for what are the most powerful tools available for personal growth work now mm -hmm. to be able to do what, uh, a guy who just became quite famous last year in the field of sustainability leadership, Professor Jim Bendel just rose to incredible stardom in this field of looking at, at the collapse of earth and human systems. Yes. And he coined the term deep adaptation. Mm -hmm. And so we could call this the development of our inner capacities and our in, inner uh, toolkit or skill set, we could call that the work of deep adaptation. And that is, in a nutshell, the type of work that I've been doing that loops back to finally answering your question of what do I do to, to be able to find joy on a daily basis? How do I recharge my batteries? How do I keep my heart open when I'm just as vulnerable to the waves of rage and, and overwhelm and frustration and, and just feeling sick, feeling sick that this is the world that we've created and we've normalized and most of us are complicit in and willfully ignorant of that complicity. So would, would it be good to talk a little bit about the actual practices, some of the actual practices? Yes, and I also think maybe just an example, like maybe an example of something recently that brought you to your knees where you felt overwhelmed or, or incapacitated temporarily. Maybe you even found yourself feeling or acting in a way that isn't who you want to be because that's how I find I get affected and I find myself not being who I really want to be when I'm when I'm overwhelmed by this stuff. Most particularly lately, it's been having kind of a negative cynicism that I don't like, I don't want to be that person, you know? So um, 
I'm wondering if you have any examples in your own life, you know, of, of when you felt taken over by something and temporarily disabled by it. And then you had to use a tool to, to yeah. you know, deal with it. Yeah. I have a few. Uh, I don't know how deep to take this, but I'm happy to give a few examples. Um, they range from like directly related to this topic because this is the kind of thing I'm working in all the time, like the issues of how do we individually and collectively face and grapple with and self-regulate in the face of these extraordinary circumstances go going on. And I, what I can tell you is that there are times when my heart breaks. I, I literally am knocked to my knees from time to time when I see uh, members of this collapse aware community, which is a kind of a continuum between people who just know things are screwed up and they're just not right. And, and so their gut is telling them that something's not right. And a continuum all the way out to the near term human extinction end of the conversation, which is, you know, as far at the extreme as, as I'm aware of, mm -hmm. which is really not a question of are things bad no it's just how bad and when will human extinction on a planetary scale occur so it's quite a continuum and within that continuum no matter where we are in that continuum it, it's pretty universal experience that it can be extraordinarily lonely because the rest of the world doesn't want to hear about this. You, you know, you're one of the main focus that you've, since I've known you, has been about loneliness. And one of the deepest pits of loneliness that I'm aware of is to be aware of this existential human caused uh, predicament that we're in. And how on earth do we stay human? How do we, uh, how on earth do we stay with our hearts open when all we've ever known, all we've been trained to do is be separate from one another in our, in this culture. And then to have a predatory capitalist incentive to keep us further and further separate and, and less and less engaged with and, and aware of the earth and our impact on it and our impact on each other. And it can be savage that the the competition and the uh, that polarity, that distance between us, really breeds a default mode. That you, I think you mentioned it in your question, is uh, when I'm dysregulated, when I'm knocked off track, I'm not on my best game. I'm I'm somehow my the wind is knocked out of me, and I. I start to act in a way that I'm not at all happy with and I'm, I'm grumpy or I'm nasty or I'm as polarized and angry and so on and, and intense as, as the next person. Mm -hmm. um, and so Dean, when you catch yourself yeah. being that way, yeah. then what? Yeah. yeah. So, so two things. One is the impact that I see when I see these interactions between others, because it's I, I'm not current in that particular dynamic right now. You know, I am from time to time, absolutely. But right this moment, I'm not. But it, it breaks my heart when I see people I respect, people that are, are just trying their best to represent in this real way what's going on. and and piercing through that loneliness, but they uh, get nasty with one another. And there's been this vitriol. It's been uh, at a quite a high level just in the past couple of weeks through an article that recently showed up in New Yorker magazine. And there were attacks on that article from very high-end science communicators. Yeah. And these are some extraordinary people just I, I deeply respect all of them. And, and to see that, those attacks from people who are this close together on that continuum is just heartbreaking. Yeah. So that's just 
that part you were asking about you know, what are some of the things that knock me off track that's that's one of them but then you also just were asking about so when i do get triggered cuz man i get triggered and i have my own brand of nastiness and when i can be just as vitriolic and and i can um be entirely unpleasant in my own special way and you know one thing that i i can say with great gratitude is I've been studying um, a bit for quite a few years, but really intensively in these past five years, the whole field of resilience skills and particularly advanced self-regulation skills. And uh, just to hearken back to a recent interview uh, from somebody that you just spent time with in Costa Rica from Joe Brewer, I. Um, I asked him, so what are the skills? I, he was asked in a couple of different interviews, one of them my own, uh, what are the skills that people are gonna need to be able to face these extraordinary times? What, what would you recommend? And his simple answer was advanced self-regulation skills and psychological flexibility. Yes. And so it's really in that particular dimension that I've been learning as much as I can from established providers of that kind of education. And I'll be mentioning a couple of, happy to mention a couple later. Uh, and then also deriving my own, from my own practices over my lifetime, there are some strong skills that I can bring of my own to that toolbox, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, just as a, as a short example, and just to give you a, a small sense, it always starts with a sensation-based and emotional body-based return to awareness in the, in the moment, as quickly as I can. Yeah. And when I realized I'm off, I have this intensity, I have this rushing of different kinds of unpleasant emotions, yeah. I have a, a hamster wheel of negativity going on of one kind or another, depending on the situation. And these, all of these skills are meant to be a return to what can sometimes be called a resilience zone, mm -hmm. a zone that is sometimes laid out in this kind of horizontal fashion with a top and a bottom layer. Right. And so I, I can be either uh, amplified, triggered to be more anxious and more intense, which is usually my style. That's just my default. So I can be knocked out of, at the high end of that resilience zone or in a more depressive and withdrawn and contracting style. I can go out the bottom end of that resilience zone. Mm -hmm. But either way, what I want to be able to do is be able to identify I'm out. I'm out of my zone. I man, I'm bumped out, and that's just as human as can be. It happens to all of us, and the question starts to become for people who really take on this particular track: is how how able am I to bring myself back? Yeah. Right. So again, yeah. yeah. Did you want to say something? What I want to say also is I notice that. I do the same thing, by the way. The first thing is come into the present moment in the body and feel it and maybe take a deep breath. Yes. And then, like you said, to try and get back into that zone. But what I find is if I'm not able to get back into that zone right away, then I have to tell myself to stop any kind of activity right? Like that's not, the, if you're outside the zone, that's not the space to be sending emails or to be, you know, trying to have a, a conversation with somebody. And then, then I start kind of asking, okay, what do I need? Do I need to go for a walk? Do I need to call a friend? Do I need to pet my dog? You know, like whatever. But if I'm not able to just get back in the zone right away, then the question is, okay, what do I need that's, that's gonna help? Um, so 
Um, I'm so glad to hear you articulate this, though, this thing about the zone, because that's yeah. so useful. And I just want to, like, emphasize that we can't always get back into the zone right away. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. that is so true. And just to kind of jump ahead a little bit, because I know we're not, you know, this is a long and, and we could spend a weekend. This is a weekend workshop worth of conversation. So I'll just go as quickly as I can to, a, an, a, to an advanced version, because I want to be talking, a, sharing a little bit about how I'm really bumping up the level of this body of work uh, can, from, for instance, where I was when I released the book, The Impossible Conversation, I assumed people process like I do. They see something that's desperately important. They make sure they confirm that it's a real thing. And then they go about changing their lives in order to accommodate that in, in some way. And it turns out, no, most people are not that way. And especially in the culture as it's become today, uh, it's probably one of the last things we'll do is take effective action of the kind we're talking about. So now, uh, risking <laughs> losing people in this conversation, uh, I'm going to talk about kind of an advanced level of what you and I were just talking about, if we could consider that the basic level, you know, the day-to-day -day basics that we return to time and time again. I can do that multiple times a day through the, the sensation, the breath, the emotional body, a few simple practices to return my, uh, the deployment of my attention to something that allows me to self-regulate, to return my, my blood pressure down, my heart rate down, to bring a, a, a different focus of my attention to different subjects, all these things that we've both just talk, been talking about. So if we left it at that, it's a useful set of skills. It's an advanced set of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a moderate level of skill set for self-regulation and and if that's the best we've got that's the that's the kind of stuff that people are often taught after a disaster has demolished a city these you know uh, kind of mental health first aid people will come in people that i've i've trained with organizations that are offering these skill sets to people in disaster situations these are the kind of skills that People can learn very quickly, integrate into their lives, and use even though they're still in a devastated neighborhood. Right. right. So now I want to step beyond that to what would it look like if there was an advanced level we could get to, even beyond that extraordinary level I was just mentioning, which I'm blown away by the people who have come up with this stuff, train this stuff, bring it to people who desperately need it. Yay. Yeah. But what that doesn't really imply is the kind of existential level predicaments that you and I are talking about when we talk about this continuum of people who are either they're definitely collapse aware and might be extraordinarily aware of how quickly and intensely things are coming at us. And, and the level of dysregulation is proportional. Okay. And the level of our built-in shadow resistance to really keeping our hearts open, to really feeling what's going on, mm -hmm. is just as profound, just as thick a resistance as anyone in the regular population of, of the USA and around the world. These are the things we don't want to talk about. They're, they are truly, as I named my book, the impossible conversation, even so are, people who know about it. Yeah. So what are some of these advanced skills? Like, was, did, what, did you want to name them? Name yeah. one or two of them? Or did you want, was there something else you wanted to move on to? Yeah. No, I'd, I'd love to. And it's, it's actually, I'm going to, cheat a little bit by just uh, articulating an exemplar or two, a, a, an example of a person 
like I did in the impossible conversation, I, I offered some examples of people who are full aware, fully aware of what's going on in the world, but they're, they're able to generate a remarkable presence, what could be called an activated presence in the face of even existential level stressors. So yeah, I do. And thanks for, thanks for uh, <laughs> corralling me in. So um, the person I want to mention that uh, is, has been on a, a few different uh, interviews with me here on the podcast and just did a, a recent interview with Jem Bendel on his deep adaptation forum conversation, you know, his, his version of the podcast as well, is Deb Ozarko. Yeah. And uh, Deb Ozarko is a, an extraordinary writer and um, just an extraordinary presence in this world. It's really inspiring to me. Um, so I could go on, but uh, what I want to speak about as Deb, as an exemplar of this advanced level self-regulation and this advanced level, what she herself calls activated presence, is uh, right now the average person that I see that I've talked with in these thousands of impossible conversations, people don't have access to an inner resource. We, we've for, long ago forfeited, again, our connection to all these primary sources of meaning in our lives, forfeited our sense of personal agency, and hence, we really have no ability or virtually no ability to create another reality for ourselves. We must stay immersed in this illusory reality. I mean, it's real as the day is long, mm -hmm. but the framing of it and the disempowerment of it is an illusion that we are all up to our earlobes in. And Deb Ozarko is an example of a person who I believe has done an extraordinary amount of personal work to reclaim that sense of agency, that sense of being able to shift one's life and one's presence in life in such a way that she is, has an immense capacity to be present in the face of whatever is happening. Mm. And it doesn't mean that she doesn't uh, get knocked off track like we were just talking about with the, the uh, resilience zone and so on. I'm, you know, she has her ups and downs as well, but her ability to return herself and where the quality and depth of that zone for her, that resilience zone is an order of magnitude larger and more powerful and more resilient than the average person that I meet. Yeah. So there, there, is an, a, there is somewhere to go. There is somewhere to reach for. No matter how, where we are on that dismal continuum that ends with near-term human extinction, there's something other to do than to be at the default of our everyday emotions and uh, what seems to be the usual binary of either I'm in despair or I'm in denial. Right. And when I'm not in either of those, I might just be raging. Right. And chances are I'm raging at the people around me that I actually love and, and least deserve it. But you get what I'm saying. Yes. And I, I, I've watched some interviews with Deb Ozarko, and I've also started reading her book. Haven't finished it. Maybe I need to finish it now since I have these questions. But um, so I do. I do know what you're talking about. Like I hear when she speaks, she has both an incredible clarity. Like there's no lying to herself about what's going on, yep. and at the same, and a t tremendous advocacy for life. Um, and I also hear her, her expressing a lot of joy and being able to just see the beauty and enjoy the beauty of what is, you know, there, there's still a lot of beauty in this, in this life. And, um, so may, maybe it's as simple as that. I keep, 
I keep telling myself that I just need to notice the beauty and and really go into a deep appreciation of what life is. Life is always trying to generate life. Life is always trying to be abundant and give, you know, and it that's just the nature of it. And to kind of go into a, a you know a deep connection and appreciation of that is what I tell myself is the way out of my cynicism. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, yeah. So so I I think that that is a practice to to do more of. Um, so, thank you for mentioning Deb. I, I appreciate that, and she is an example of of yep. that way of of meeting reality without letting it get you down too much. Um, so, I'm wondering if you might want to tell share more with us. You mentioned at the beginning of the interview that you're 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 kind of at the beginning of a new phase of your podcast and that you're um, taking things in a new direction. What would you like to let us know about that? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, I'd love to share a little bit about it. And, and let's just start with the Debo Zarco thing. Um, yeah. It's really, the, it's a combination of Deb and her expression of the work and then her mentor, Louise Lebrun. I've had the, the, just the joy of connecting up with Louise from time to time. And she's been generous enough to uh, expose me to uh, the audio recordings that she offers of, of her workshops in the past. She no longer does these workshops herself, but there are a number of people who have trained under her that offer the work. Now that that's the good news. The bad news for people like myself is that she only does the work or they only do the work that 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 lineage with women. Oh. So that's great news for y'all. <laughs> and if I were a woman in, you know, in even slightly interested in this conversation that you and I are having, I would be looking up Louise Lebrun and I would be looking up Debo Zarco to find her Beyond Hope book that you were just mentioning, and I'd be reading that. It's just, there's no more powerful place to start. Yeah. But let me reel it back. Yeah. Give you, a, give you a fuller picture of what I'm talking about. Okay. This, this lineage of Louise and her work and, and Deb, how she's adapted it and, and lives it, is uh, is an interweaving of a number of elements that I think Louise has has really done an artful job of that weaving. And uh, there, many of the elements are very very familiar to me in terms of the uh, what I could call a transformation based track of different methodologies for delivering human potential training. And that's really the the world that I grew up in. In you know, for people who are old enough to remember the S training or Life Spring and Psy and Super Camp and so on, a, a number of different providers. And uh, what's encouraging is that uh, both Louise LeBrun and her work, and also another guy we might get around to talking about, Clinton Callahan, have uh, really picked up some of the most important golden elements of that transformational work and that and that lineage and they've brought it into a whole new level of embodiment and connected with some of the elements that you and I've already been talking about with the self-regulation skills and so on and going deep into uh, advanced distinctions and experiences with regard to being empowered accessing true empowerment no matter how long we have left on the planet for those i'm speaking right now to those people in the near-term human extinction crowd you know no matter how short your timeline my question to you is how empowered would you like to be in those last 10 years or 20 years or whatever your projection is and again i'm i'm just also wanting to offer the best skills and and methodologies that i can find 
to people to be able to uh, people that I care about deeply and respect deeply on this continuum of collapse aware. To that, can I just can I just say when you asked that question, how empowered would you like to be? Yeah. The answer that rose up inside me is very, <laughs> like, <laughs> like what am I waiting for? Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, really, you know. Um, so, so, but I, I hear the, the, um, or I feel the courage that it takes even to say that because it means leaving a certain ways of being behind, you know, but yeah. the answer is very, I want to be very empowered. I know the world needs it. So I'm curious, would, do you have like a, a, like a cert, like a distilled version of these golden nuggets from Louise LeBrun and Clinton. You yeah. know, mentioned some golden nuggets, and I'm, I'd just love to hear them. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, and I just love what you just said. You're like, why? Why would you want to wait? I'm thinking the same. You know what I what I'm seeing is I know at least half a dozen people who deliver the daily news on news of doom on their YouTube channels and they're really good at it and they're far better at it than I am. And I bless them because I watch them and I, I appreciate them delivering it, but it's the same shit every damn day. And there's nothing, there's no self-regulation skills. There's no empowerment skills. There's no way to re to return to a sense of reconnection with deeper self, other people, earth, there's no empowerment. And so it's really like dosing ourselves with, with sludge every single right. day. What purpose does that news serve unless it empowers us to action, right? Well, or at least to a, act, a sense of activated presence. Yes. To being fully alive. Because I'm not a big fan of necessarily jumping into action. I'm not certain that action is always what's called for. What's called for as far as I can see when we're talking about this level of advanced track, these golden nuggets that I'm about to go into, we're, we're talking about an, a deep honoring of what is at the core of the life, the presence of the web of life in each of us. Mm. And uh, one piece of jargon I use myself is about that is the truth of the moment. Am I, am I fully conscious to the truth of the moment? Am I aware of that truth that the moment is speaking through me and around me? And am I bringing my attention to that in order to choose what is the right action right now? Yes. Because most of us have, we're so externally referent we have our attention on, on our phones and on social media and on everything outside of us. We have this gigantic blind spot where that awareness would want to live. Yes, and what you just said that this, these, these new, this bad news that we could read daily yeah. wakes up something deep inside us. And what you just said about deep honoring of the core of the web of life, the thing that gets activated inside us when we hear the bad news, that is the web of life inside us. I think that, is that what you're saying? I'm actually saying the opposite. Oh, okay. I'm saying that the average person, and I'll just speak about my own tendencies here, you know, and other people you can look for yourselves. When, when I am just by default going to this top five or six different providers of the doom gloom report of the day, I'm going to, to get what little fix of, of a confirmation of the business as usual reality that I'm immersed in. I'm getting my fix of being certain about something because there's so much uncertainty and my system by default, I don't want to feel. I don't want to feel that level of uncertainty. I don't want to feel the fear of possible extinction. I don't want to really feel what it's like to have to give up life for, for at, the, at the scale of billions of people. Hell, yeah, you get the idea. Uh -huh. 
So I think that's what we do by default. And that's why we keep delivering. That's why those people that I respect and appreciate so much that are delivering that news, they're doing the best they can. And I, when I'm in that mode of just wanting my fix of certainty, as, as bad as it is, as sludge drenching as it is, I'm doing the best that I can in that moment to just feel a sense of certainty so I don't have to feel the uncertainty. I don't have to feel the deep fear and the deep grief because that's the last thing that our culture wants us to do is to be present to those, the depth of those feelings. Right. So what, if not that, then what? And I've already kind of been nudging toward it in what I've been saying, but those nuggets that, that you're asking about are literally a way to, to be able to deploy our attention in a different way, to be able to realize that we actually have an intent, a, a way of catalyzing that activated presence in ourselves and to interact with life in an extraordinarily different way. So what is that way of interacting with life? Yeah. That's different. I want to know about that. It, it, it's from the most simple to the most sublime. Yeah. So at the most simple level, I'm a, I'm a, uh, next week I'm going to be flying out to do two workshops, two back-to-back -back workshops that are called Possibility Labs. I mentioned just a little while ago, along with Louise Lebrun's work, there's this work from a, another person named Clinton Callahan, and his work is called Possibility Management. And what uh, this is, both of those are just a couple of tools that I found extraordinarily useful to put in my inner toolkit to answer for myself the question that you just asked a little while ago, like, why wait? Why wait to become as empowered as I can possibly be, no matter what the timeline is of, that we have left in this planet? Both of them have extraordinary tools and processes to be able to build out that experience of activated presence in ourselves. They right. might be slightly different jargon, but the, the end result ends up being the same. Right, so, and so I, keep, I feel like we're, we're honing in now and I wanna drill down into, can you tell me what that activated presence is like experientially? Yeah. Like, how does it feel when you're in that state? Yep. Great. So um, I'm going to add a, just a tiny bit more jargon. It means the same thing, but this is just how it lives inside of me to answer your question. Mm -hmm. I call it a state of grace. Mm -hmm. So I'm stopping right now. Yeah. <laughs> It's that close all the time. And I've had an extraordinary life where I've had a number of immersions in that state of grace, including one that was months long after an injury. And that, you know, all it takes is a few moments of immersion in this state of grace. And I would assert that a person's life is, is different. And it's something that one would want to turn to see again and experience again many times in, the, in their life if they're smart. And what's it like? Yeah. What's it like, that state of grace? Yeah, it's, it's literally at the opposite end of the spectrum that I experience in the business as usual world, where my attention is on the tiny details of all the things going on, the crazy politics and Trump this and the NRA that and pollution this and dying animals here and blah, blah, blah. It's just all this ways to have my attention go out in the world and to have no ability left to be able to uh, authentically connect 
with my deeper wisdom, with other people, with earth, and with soul. Okay. So I have no significant input or infusion of life energy, and my intention is going out, and my intent is going out in an automatic and reflexive way, not at all in a way that is activated presence. It's not conscious. It's it's literally knee jerk. No wonder we have such a polarized world. Yes. No wonder we have a world in which we have a, a population that can stare at the news screen at the end of the day and hear about how many more families have been broken up at the border and how many more uh, atrocities are being done in our name. And then we just kind of roll over and look for some other kind of entertainment. Right, so what you're saying is it's the opposite of that. Yes. So if it's the opposite of that, what I'm experiencing when I just did that a moment ago, just in a, within a few seconds, that's the, the, the joyous level that my practice has gotten to is I can cue myself to be able to access that state in seconds on demand. And, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure mm -hmm. that I'd be alive today if I didn't have access to that grace, to that activated presence, to that transformed, cracked open to possibility way of experiencing life. So I haven't drilled down to quite enough detail, I think. Is there anything you'd like to ask or say to clarify? Well, I think you said that you're glad that you can cue yourself. And yeah. so part of what I'm thinking is, oh, well, this is the result of 30, 40 years of practices that you've accumulated and built. And then this is just the way it, where you've arrived now yeah. after all those years. And for those of us who don't have your 30 or 40 years of experience of doing all of that, how could I cue myself into that? I mean, is it something that's personal? Do we, does each of us have to find our own way into that world? Or is, it, is there kind of a trick where you could just say, okay, this is how you cue yourself to the state of grace? Yeah, great question. And I think it's both. I think that there will always be a personal signature for each of us, ways that we find for ourselves, our inner toolkit. Yours will be different than mine. But the glorious part of that is we can share, and there will be some ways in which they overlap. And that kind of sharing is some of the most alive relationships I've got in my world. I can go on, I can be in that energy and that kind of environment and that kind of conversation and relationship with people. I'm, I'm happy to be there for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, truthfully, I'm trying to build it that way, you know, my, my life and, and being immersed in that. And why, you know, to loop it back to the original reason we started up this convers this part of the conversation is that I've been truly gathering the most powerful tools I can that are fast, are, you know, as fast as can happen, because it's, there's some elements that do just take time and they just take damn hard work. And, and some of it's not very pleasant. Right. But there are parts that are amazingly uh, refreshing and rejuvenating and reconnecting in a ridiculously short period of time. Mm. You know, some of the, the pieces that I'm talking about, just hearing audio tapes of, um, of Louise Lebrun's work or, you know, listening to a bit of that, can, can, I can get these waves of refreshing of my spirit, of my, of my presence. Uh, similarly with Clinton Callahan's possibility management work, you know, there's a, 
in, in a three-day initial workshop that they call the expanding the box uh, there are dozens of opportunities for for every person in the room if they desire to to dive in to be able to experience their own system being opened up in that way Cho they, they, they choose for themselves to open themselves up in that way and so uh, there are ways to move more quickly than you know what's been known for a long time the the ancient wisdom traditions are you know we're talking lifetimes yeah and as you and i both know we don't have lifetimes to work on this we yes. need we need to move quickly but i'm but what i'm hearing is you are talking about an opening up you know you've been using that phrase and that resonates for me because my experience of tapping into that state of grace I, I don't have that word for it, but I, ha I kind of experientially have a way of um, opening up. And for me, it's a feeling of like, all of a sudden like that, I dissolve, like my body's gone. And I, there's, just, there's just all that is in that moment. There's, yeah. just, there's just life. And it's almost like, I mean, maybe the wisdom traditions would say there's a dissolving of the ego, yeah. but that's what happens in that moment. Like Laura's gone and then Laura's anger is gone. Laura's um, cynicism is gone. Laura's worries are gone. Yep. And, and that, that is a profoundly empowering state to be in. Does yep. that resonate for what you're talking about? Really beautifully said just gorgeous how you just laid that out and i all i'd like to do is is add a, a slightly different dimension to it kind of in a both and fashion so what you were just describing seemed like it was the imagine a balloon a big old balloon you were talking it seemed like about that outer edge of the balloon and as if it if it could start to be diffused and it and there's this sense of connectedness with everything at the outer edge of our experience yeah. What I would also add is that in my experience, there's an inner edge as well. So if I could put myself inside of that balloon, there there is also a, a very common experience for people who are involved in, in advanced levels of this work, where it can start to feel like I'm actually in a liquid state. So instead of the normal body sensations and the normal uh, emotional world that I carry with me every day, things start to get, uh, instead of having hard edges and I'm holding on tight and I'm righteous about this and goddamn Trump that, and you know, I've got whatever expressions that I do and there it's, it's a tightly held structure. That's that certainty that I was mentioning before that we all have our version of it. It's what has us be able to relax and know, okay, at least I got this world that I understand that I'm that's familiar and I'm going to hold it in place. God damn it. Yeah. And what happens in advanced levels of this work and the, the advanced levels don't have to take long, you know, within a, a three day workshop, the very first exposure that people could have, they can start to experience this new malleability, this new permeability, this ability to release a bit of the grip that we have on, on holding our, our world in place so tight, so exhausting. Yeah. And, and what starts to ensue is this sense of liquidity. What comes to mind is like the liquid state that the caterpillar goes into in the chrysalis before the butterfly emerges. That's indeed, no kidding, a liquid state. Yeah. And what I can say is there's good news and bad news there in my experience. A liquid state offers immense possibility and a, an extraordinary transformation, like, like new insights and new ways of relating and sensing and so on that, that are unimaginable before. That's exquisite. Yes. But what I can also say out of my own experience over years of having done this time and time and time again, and I'll do it again next week and the week after that, is 
there are times when I still want to hold on. And the, to the degree I try to hold on to various aspects of this business as usual world, the experience of becoming a, a more of a liquid state can be tremendously uncomfortable. It can involve having to own my own shadow, you know, because we're, we're all of us being led in this world by a shadow, by shadow governments and corporations and shadows of ourselves individually are rampant in our world. And that is some incredible, can be some incredibly challenging and uncomfortable work yeah. to allow ourselves to release the grip of pretending we don't have a shadow, pretending that the world's really not collapsing around us and actually becoming fully aware and activated presence within that awareness. I hope that's not too much woo-woo yeah. jargon there. Not at all. In fact, what I'm here, I'm hearing a couple things in there. One is that I think that I'm imagining, because I haven't done the workshop you're talking about, but I'm imagining that one thing that helps you to stay in the liquid state or even be able to cross the threshold and enter that state is the support of others, other yeah. people who are, who are, you know, holding you. Yep. And so that speaks to our need for others on this journey. Yep. And, and there was something else I was going to say uh, too, but I'm temporarily forgetting what it was. So I'll, I'll just let it go for now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I can, I can definitely ride from there. I, you've really touched on one of the most important elements because I, I've been, my jaw has dropped so often at how bad we are at having meaningful connection with other people. You know, what? It, what in my worst times when I'm the most discouraged about how the world is going, I see us going down with this kind of insipid silence where everybody's just looking at, at their favorite screen device and looking at their favorite way of being entertained and we're not talking about anything that truly matters. Yeah. That's, that's my nightmare. And some of the other, so not all of the tools in the toolbox that I've been talking about are so dynamic and liquid state and all this shadow. And that's, that's some pretty intense stuff. And it's for those people that choose that, those tools. And the, they won't be for everybody. Some other tools that I found ex extraordinarily important and valuable are uh, more of a gentle and inviting and emergent kind of a space for people to come together in a safe way and to have a, a, a methodology of being able to open our hearts together in as safe an environment as we can and as potent a way as we can to really be responsible in how we show up in relationship with each other, whether that's in, in terms of a family group or an intimate couple or a neighborhood group that wants to get together and, and build relationship in the face of oncoming large scale stressors. Yeah. I can think of no more important thing to be doing than getting together with people and doing the hard work that it is to get with other people and just communicate, just relate and bond. Yeah. Even before there's an idea about a particular project for the neighborhood or something for our family to heal and so on, this yeah. is also hard work. And there are some methodologies in that same toolkit that are just beautiful. There, there's, there is some really strong methodology now available that doesn't take a long time to learn. This is not difficult material. It just takes the courage of being willing to 
be the person that reaches out and saying, hey, this Sunday afternoon, how about if we get together and connect for a little while? What if we have a family circle, family conversation, check in with one another? You get the idea. Yeah, and in some way, even though it's not as dramatic, I think that you're also talking about, to some extent, being in a liquid state because inviting people over and and letting go of the normal ways that we try and interact you know follow the social norms of small talk and all of that yeah when you let go of those norms you are stepping into a liquid state yeah and i guess what i want to say about that um is when you were talking about the liquid state my association to that was I don't know if this is true and I don't think it could ever be proven, but that that is Gaia consciousness um, on Gaia's terms, that, that when we're in these more rigid kind of holding on to our positions and all that, that we're more in our anthropocentric, you know, this is how humans do it. Mm -hmm. And that when we let go, we kind of release ourselves into Gaia and we, uh our what is available to us when we are released into gaia is all of gaia's resource <laughs> all of gaia's intelligence all of gaia's years of evolutionary history of how gaia does life and that we are we make ourselves open and available to receiving that inspiration and guidance yes so, and so i that's what I thought when I heard you talk about the liquid state. Well, I'm going to get out on the skinny branches right here and guess that uh, Louise Lebrun is probably going to watch this podcast. And I bet you she's giggling to herself right now at the extraordinary articulation that you just made of, I think she might call it the God force. That would be her way of saying that Gaia energy and again, I'm on skinny branches because I don't want to presume to know what her reactions are or how she would say it. But it just seems like this is really similar to the, what she calls being able to access the God force energy within each of us. Different right. words, identical energy as far as I hear it and feel it. Well, Dean, what a beautiful place we've arrived. Yeah, yeah to this place and how organically we arrived here because i don't you know i don't think either of us knew that we were going to land in this place yeah but what a beautiful place to be indeed indeed so uh it sounds like we might need to do episode two of this at some point, you know, in this fall into winter season, if, if you're up for it, I would love it. It's been a, a wonderful conversation for me. Yeah. And I guess I would, I would just be inclined to say, this is we, what we've covered in this time together is kind of a, a brief snapshot of different aspects of how this work is evolving. And what my intention is, is to create a number of different offerings that allow people to come together in whatever their particular form of this work is, this deep adaptation work, what, however that's showing up for each of us, there will be room for any version of it to be held in any number of these offerings that are uh, that we really didn't get much of a chance to talk about. Yes, we did. We went into so much detail around, and I know it was because my, I have such a curiosity, and so I kept driving. Yeah. Okay, what are those golden nuggets, Dean? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, we didn't get to talk about some other things I know we wanted to get to, but yeah.
You know, one, one piece, if, if I could just take one more moment, uh, I would like to spend just a moment telling you about a new project that uh, myself and a, a handful of others that is, keeps being a, a growing handful of others are producing a, uh, a focused series of interviews, which may end up being as many as 40, 50, 60 or more interviews over the next few months of 2019 and into 2020 uh, about collapse aware parenting. Mm. So what is it to be a parent in these times? You know, it's, we've been talking this whole hour about what is it to, to face this as an individual human being and, and with the various elements in our lives, but this series will have a focus on what is it to be a parent in these times and to be able to focus on some of the unique challenges uh, and opportunities of that combination. And so uh, for those who have not yet gone to livingresilience.net and on the front page signed up for the newsletter, that's the best way I could tell you to stay in touch with what's, what's coming. Uh, there'll be a, a examples of all the pieces we've talked about, various uh, podcast episodes that will directly address and, and fill out some of the detail of what Laura and I have been talking about, and particularly about this parenting project. So um, thanks for sticking around a couple of extra minutes for me to say that, Laura. Is there anything yeah. that, that you would like to say to just complete this time for yourself? Hmm. Uh, just grateful for our connection, Dean, and for the work that you're doing in the world, for the sincerity and devotion with which you are uh, continuing to walk the walk and continuing to have your laser focused on what are the most powerful uh, modalities and techniques that help people to, to ground and center and regulate and then get in the maximum empowerment. Uh, I'm just so appreciative that you're doing that work and that you keep listening. You know, you're listening for what needs to be honed and tweaked so to be maximally uh, potent at this time because we don't have to, any time to waste so i'm just so grateful for the work that you're doing and grateful for these generative conversations because they give so much to me yeah well thanks mm -hmm. yeah and laura i i really want to thank you and um just point at how um, easy it has been to feel connected with you, uh, really be inspired by the initial loneliness project work that had me give you a call and set up an interview, and how um, nourishing it is to be able to keep connecting with a kindred spirit, which I absolutely consider you to be. And and thanks so much for taking this time, really giving me an opportunity to, to speak more about this work and my own evolution in it um, than I usually get a chance to yeah. say. So thank you so much. Um, You're I welcome. Think, and I, I, wanna, I'm, I think we do need to do an episode too because I know there's a lot that we didn't talk about today. So, yeah. Well, maybe we could just make this a regular, you know, <laughs> a regular uh, <laughs> interval of the uh, Poetry of Predicament podcast. And uh, once again, just thank you so much. And everybody out there in uh, Poetry of Predicament land, look for uh, updates, especially in the last part of October 2019. We're going to really start. Uh, pumping out the, the updates and the news releases about this work. <laughs>
so thank you so much for watching and see you next time okay thanks bye everybody <laughs>